So that was the motivation and introduction for this course. And now we'll go over to the second part, building a chip. So there's a general design approach basically for any engineering problem. So I can answer a question or ask a question, how should engineers build a bridge? A very difficult and big task. And the answer is, how do you go about and do this type of thing? You divide and conquer. Each part you abstract away and each uh, different team of engineers does one task that we can all glue together. So we start by partitioning the design. We make many sub problems that each sub problem is manageable. Often this partitioning happens hierarchically. So each sub design is partitioned into many other sub designs and so forth until one engineer or one team of engineers can go and carry it out. Okay, we have to usually define a mathematical model for the sub problem and find an algorithmic solution for it. Um, this helps us model what we're gonna do, see how it's going to work and so forth. But you really have to be careful of model limitations and check them because if we have a bad model or an incorrect model, then garbage in, garbage out, and whatever we did will not work in the end. Okay. Once we have our model, we develop the solution for the model, then we uh, start to implement the algorithm. We use different design tools, some design automation, and we have to define interfaces between the different parts. So, for example, in our... Um, picture over here we have the interface this type of a block has a hole on it this type of a block has a little connector and we know that this type of connector will uh, hook up to this type of hole and when each team of engineers built their little puzzle piece they'll connect together at the end so interfaces are very critical we need to define our inputs we need to define our outputs the next uh, abstraction level has to receive our outputs and the previous abstraction level has to provide their outputs as inputs to ours okay uh, it's very important to implement checking tools for boundary conditions. We need to verify and validate our design. So um, usually this is done by a third party. So if the designer comes and uh, designs whatever block he's doing, we usually take a different team, a different engineer, an outsider to come and verify that what we did is what we meant to do. It's very important to do this by somebody else and not by the person who's designing so some sort of basic mistake that's in there doesn't uh, continue on with us and we think it's the correct thing okay finally we need to connect everything we need to make a flow we need to concatenate the design tools to general design flows that can be managed so we have very important flows a process of things step by step that we pass okay finally we see what works what doesn't work and we go back to the beginning and rethink of how we're doing our design. So I've discussed abstraction several times, so let's discuss basic design abstraction in our field of chip design. There are several ways to look at this. Um, any different lecturer can describe this in different ways, but I will, I will show it in the following. So we start with the system level. Um, describing the system as a very large abstract thing, dive into what we call register transfer level, or better known as RTL, which we will discuss many, many times throughout the course. In fact, we'll learn all about RTL in the next lecture. Um, RTL will be synthesized into gate level, which is a, a description of how we have different logic digital gates and how they're connected together. Um, the gates are built out of transistors or out of single devices. So if we have these gates that uh, we, if we have these transistors that we connect them together, we can build a gate and then we don't have to think about the, the transistors anymore. The transistors actually are a bunch of different uh, photo masks that are generated in a certain way and then they go through process design steps that make the physical actual electronic thing that uh, can create these transistors and that's called the layout level and the mask level is the actual photo masks that we use to make these so um, i'll go over these things in the next few slides but i just wanted to show that we do this design from top down we start with the system and we go down all the way to the mask level we have to do everything but it's very important to verify that what we did from the bottom up every single step of the way what we did is what we meant to do and it works Okay, a different view of this uh, process uh, in uh, computer ar architecture or chip design uh, it comes over here on, on the right. So starting from the top, we have an ap application or an algorithm that uh, we want to carry out. But starting from the bottom, we have the basic physics, you know, Ohm's law and Maxwell's law and so forth that we have to, to do. So we use the physics to make devices. And once we have a device such as a transistor, we can take those transistors, put them together to build some sort of a circuit. Okay, um, if we have a circuit, for example, 
the gate level that we had over here, we can make different uh, logic units and we can use register transfer level language to describe what type of logic we want to do. And there is a direct copy, a uh, direct translation from this register transfer, transfer level to the circuits that we have below. Um, we then build a micro architecture of how we can carry out different types of uh, instructions and different type of operations using um, uh, at a higher level and we can describe that with our register transfer level um, usually on top of the micro architecture we have some sort of instruction set architecture so a more um, abstract way of describing the things um, that is taken care of step by step with our microarchitecture. On top of our instruction set architecture, we have something like an operating system that knows how to use it or, or compiled programming languages. Okay, and they already carry out our applications and algorithms, um, which are written in one of these higher level programming languages. So that's another view of this type of design abstraction that we have. Again, most engineers or most people are only uh, really experts at one or another of these levels and not more than them and in fact each one of them has teams that each one is uh, is an expert in some sort of sub level but uh, as long as for example we take our circuits if we're at the circuits we have to have input from the device guys such as the models of the transistors and we have output such as the gates and their characteristics that then can be used by this register transfer level so these guys in the circuit level um, they only are experts at that. They know how to use these model files. They don't know actually how to make these devices. They don't even have to know the math behind the physics. Um, but they know how to use these types of devices in order to build gates. The guys at the register transfer level don't need to know how to make the actual gates or how to connect the circuits together. All they need to do is know that we have these circuits, they have this type of functionality, and then they can use them. And that's how we divide and conquer. So let's start going over these different levels um, just for a quick moment. So system level abstraction, which is out of the scope of this course, but just to talk about it, we have some sort of algorithm or application or whatever, and we will describe it at a high level, for instance, with uh, C or system C or some other programming language, and we describe at a very high level what we want to do. It's very abstract because it doesn't have any implementation details or any timing uh, inside, and it's very efficient to start up and, and make a compact execution model as a first design that shows us kind of how the thing is going to work and kind of what it's uh, what it's going to do um, but it's uh, different uh, difficult to maintain throughout the project because there is no link to implementation it's a very high level thing um, if you want to learn about it I, I suggest taking an embedded systems course going from the system level down to the register transfer level and that is already part of our curriculum here we have a cycle accurate model model that's very close to the hardware implementation. We use bit vector data types and operations um, that are abstractions from bit level implementation. So basically we have a bunch of zeros and ones which are usually um, some sort of a voltage level and uh, we we uh, use these zeros and ones as bits and we can build bit vectors out of them and everything we do in register transfer level is using these bit vectors such as you can see here a 32-bit register okay um, we use different types of sequential constructs such as if then else um, to support the modeling of complex control flow and uh, uh, we will learn about that a lot in our next lecture and we'll know how to exactly describe register transfer level. Um, register transfer level is still a behavioral description, it's a high level description, but in the end we have to make these logic gates that, uh, that, that we're, we, can, we know how to uh, physically implement. So we need to take that register transfer level and make this gate level abstraction. Okay, um, the gate level abstraction means that we can make some sort of a usually a finite state machine to make a sequential system and we can take a finite state machine and turn it into a bunch of logic gates such as the NAND gates that are shown over here and the flip flop that's shown over here and carry out um, whatever we wrote in the register transfer level um, uh, using Boolean logic. Okay, uh, another thing about this is that when, once we have gates, we can know characteristics such as the actual delay of the gates. Here you see this is a 3 nanosecond delay and this is a 5 nanosecond delay and so forth. And we can look at the, the, uh, the gates and have different models that um, tell us what the delays, what the power and so forth of the gates, maybe even of the wires at the gate level abstraction. Um, from uh, from the gate level, we, we have to dive down into the transistor level all the way to the mask level. And actually, that's, again, out of the scope of this course. And I will uh, maybe uh, describe it in other courses in the future. But um, 
the 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 transistor me me level we have these compact models that describe how the devices work um, that enable us to to run circuit simulation and use that to build our gates that we can use for our RTL okay um, we have the layout level which is actually how to take those transistors and design the actual layers and polygons that will um, connect them together and uh, we'll be able to to fabricate them and then we have the masks which is taking this layout type of stuff and creating the actual photographical masks that we can use to do a uh, fabrication process so i'm not going to discuss that much here um, I just want to take a break and discuss something that I think I will go into every um, every lesson, uh, every lecture during this course, and it's the IEEE Chip Hall of Fame. And it's just a kind of an inspiring side note that uh, there is this uh, thing on IEEE called the Chip Hall of Fame where they took famous microprocessors, and I want to point out a, a few. So I will start with that same uh, CPU that started it all that um, we discussed before, the Intel 4004. And it, again, was the first commercially available monolithic CPU. So it was the first time that they ever took all the components of a microprocessor and put them on one single substrate. It was released in 1971 with 2,300 transistors. And remember, that is uh, not that long ago, and we've already uh, had many, many orders of magnitudes uh, higher ability to do this integration on a die. It's pretty amazing from thousand transistors now we're talking about billions of transistors on the, on the same type of a chip um, as you can see the the chip was in this type of a, pa a dual inline package um, with only a few maybe uh, something like 16 um, pins on it that could connect to it it ran at a really high frequency of 740 kilohertz so you see we got kind of faster in the last uh, few decades and the process technology was 10 micron PMOS technology. Remember um, that Intel chip we showed from a couple years ago is already 14 nanometer FinFET. So we're talking about microns versus nanometers. There's a, a, another three orders of magnitude difference in, in the size of each transistor, basically. Um, it also, uh, uh, um, interestingly, had a 4-bit data bus. You don't really find 4-bit computers around much uh, anymore. Um, this was actually uh, interestingly designed as a side project. So Intel was a uh, memory company. They wanted to develop and sell DRAM, but they, um, from what they say, they were trying to keep uh, some cash flow. So they got this side project and they hired this guy, Federico Fagan, who was a, uh, a, a chip designer. They didn't have actually logic designers. And he um, basically, uh, the guy who's shown here, looking at the layout of the, uh, of the 4004, he's the one who carried out this project pretty much on his own. Um, and uh, it was actually a project that was designed for a uh, Japanese company called Buzicom who wanted to make this calculator and Intel designed a uh, chipset called the MCS4 chipset, which were four chips, 4001, 4002, 3, and 4004, where the 4004 was this microprocessor that they decided to put on one chip and um, they made a deal with uh, Buzicom that they could actually sell it to other people and this um, chip became a very popular product and started Intel as we know it today.